All right. This, after, or this evening we're going to continue on. Kurt really set the stage for us quite appropriately. What I'm going to cover in my presentation will be the early Japanese games. Kurt alluded to this a little bit in his presentation. But if you see my maps and what I'm going to tell you, you're going to be kind of wondering what kept Japan from going to Australia. They were that close. And if they had a little more resources and they were planning, they would have been in Australia. In fact, they did bomb Australia, as you remember. Bomb uh, Darwin, as well as a number of different places in northern Australia during 1942. And part of our strategy, utilizing Douglas MacArthur, who was again dispatched back to Australia after leaving the Philippines, was to try to protect Australia. I'm going to also talk about uh, Douglas MacArthur and Chester Nimitz and all Admiral Hal Halsey, because they're going to split the Pacific Theater in a very unique way. This is the first time in the history of the United States where we have army generals that are commanding navy assets, as well as naval admirals that are commanding army assets. It's never happened before. And I'll talk to you about the reason for that, because today when we see inter-service rivalries, and we do get a little hint of that once in a while, even though there's great levels of cooperation today, a lot of that stems back from the early groundwork that we set with this uh, approach in World War II. And you have three different personalities here. And we'll talk about those personalities very briefly. We're going to talk about the campaign on New Guinea, which was the Southwest Pacific operation, Douglas MacArthur, and how he tried to move up. His eventual goal was to return to where again? Philippines, he's going to come back. We're going to talk about the campaign on New Britain and Solomons, which is going to be a South Pacific operation. Admiral Halsey will be part of that. We're going to talk about Operation Cartwheel, which is tied into this, especially the operation against Rabaul, which is the southern Japanese center in these uh, islands, and really the command uh, and control point for Japan during this whole uh, operation and how essential it was for the United States and their allies to knock this out. And we'll also talk about Saipan because Saipan is such a critical battle. And it's also going to put an indelible stain in the American GI's mind because these, the island hopping campaign as they advance further and further in, it's going to come at greater and greater cost, and it's going to be psychologically scarring, because it's not only going to involve military casualties, but they're now going to start encountering Japanese uh, civilians who have been given the word by the, by the emperor, Hirohito, don't give up. And if you're going to give up, you either A, fight to the death, or you commit suicide. In Saipan, countless thousands of women and children committed seppuku, which is disembowelment, or they dived off a cliff to their death. No matter what we were trying to convey to them about giving up, they would not give up. That's how committed they were to this. And that was psychologically traumatizing. Imagine being a GI or a dog face and you come from Iowa where you have a great value for life and now suddenly you see people diving off a cliff who are not involved with the combat. They have no reason to. You're not going to shoot them. So how this all plays together. Now we talked and Kurt alluded to this. The big score that Japan wanted in 1941, early 1942 is East the, uh, Brit the Dutch East Indies. To put it in perspective, it's the fourth largest oil reserve in the world at that time. Japan has no oil. They produce less than 10% of their own domestic oil. This is going to be their oil well. It was so critical for them to have this. 
And when they got the Dutch East Indies, and they got it because part of the problem was in the early days following Pearl Harbor, our coordination between the Allies was not very good. We had the Australians, we had the Dutch, and we had the Americans. And each one had his own perspective on what should be protected. Clearly, the Dutch wanted to save Java and Sumatra. Why? That's theirs. Well, it's all that's left to really... But please, I'll add on later. I appreciate your, your help. Add on later. We also have the Americans and the Australians that want to save what they can in terms of Papua New Guinea and uh, New Guinea itself, because that protects their back door. And we want the, Brit the British to save the Sing Singapore, because it is one of the largest places in, in that area. It's a British colony. So they have locus of control issues. What should we save? How should we save it? And where do we draw the line? So that became a problem. And in fact, the resources that they were throwing against Japan, Japan has the naval resources. Kurt was very emphatic about this. This is pre-Midway. They have the carriers. We have no battleships. We have carriers. We have an aging air force. And we're not able to put up a sustained fight. So they're going to be very easy about getting this. Now, the Japanese also have some auxiliary motives. They want to harass and try to take Ceylon and also India. Why? The largest colonies outside of Britain are where? India, Ceylon, big British colonies. They can take one of those. What is it going to do to morale at the, on the British side? It's going to go down very dramatically. Remember, this is the same time What's going on in Britain? 19, late 1940, early 41. Air war. Air war. Just getting off Battle of Britain. This is not a good time for them. So this would be a bad situation. 